Happy New Year, everyone. We're back and I'm joined today by Dr. Jamie Hines. It's great to have you on. Now, whereabouts in the country do you practice as a GP? I'm a GP in the Black Country. We've got surgeries, one in Tipton, one in Sedgley, and I'm a trainer for Dudley VTS and I'm a training programme director for West Birmingham. And do you have a formal role in the RCGP? Well, I'm currently the vice chair of Midland faculty of the college. Just a couple of months ago, I was awarded faculty champion by the college in terms of just promoting the work of the faculty and, and the joys of general practice. So it's, uh, it's, it's having that sort of role. I've been on RCGP council. It's somebody else's turn at the moment. But yeah, I've been honorary secretary of the faculty before becoming vice chair. So it was just one of those organizations where I found people that sort of, you know, inspired and gave me joy. And so I stayed and have uh, gone into the different faculty positions from there you're obviously taking the role of promoting general practice very seriously i've just seen the video that you produced called it's a gp's wonderful life and it's amazing so how did that come about the central premise is that if you look at the evidence on continuity of care and what that means for patients, what that means for professionals, you can pull the data and you can look at it and say, OK, right. If you increase hospital doctors by more than 1%, you get 186 fewer hospital deaths over a four year period. But increasing GPs by 1% results in 575 fewer hospital deaths over that same four year period. And you can hear those stats. And I'm hoping people are quite bored by it because <laughs> it doesn't grit me. It doesn't sort of to get me in terms of that feeling that is there. And from Myers-Briggs point of view, I'm an ESFJ. So I'm very much about the sort of the feelings of it and that phrase of sort of people can forget what you've said, but they can't forget the way that you made them feel. So the idea was to say, right, how can I take the evidence on continuity of care and put it into the things that we respond to and the things that we respond to are stories. And It's a Wonderful Life is an absolute classic festive story about a man who in the film obviously wishes he was never born now I didn't want to go too dark in terms <laughs> of the festive story uh, but the idea of saying this person is approaching burnout and getting people to sort of you know care about the reality of what these statistics genuinely mean how is it reflected you know you can sort of take this idea and say well in it's a wonderful life he wishes he was never born if we can translate that to somebody a GP who wished they'd never chosen general practice then you can start to show these statistics on continuity of care in a real way in a character that you've invested in. So the idea of narratives and storytelling is that you introduce a character, you sort of establish their ideals, you make them want to root for them, and then you put them in some kind of peril. And then the idea of showing that level of redemption, it just gives that feel good dopamine hit that we all need from a good story. Is the idea about promoting the impact of continuity or is it about providing motivation for GPs who are thinking, you know what, is it all a bit too much for me right now? We feel that pressure. I feel that pressure in terms of working I work seven sessions a week and then the training program director as well as that. I feel what it's like in general practice when we're understaffed, when we're going through the current struggles. So as part of that, when you're in that situation of adversity, you have to sort of think, well, what is the central reason I'm doing this? Why does it matter? And somebody put it as a phrase of sort of when you're going through an ice age, you don't put the fire that warms you out. You've got to remind yourself of this is what it's all for. This is what high quality invested general practice looks like and what it delivers. So it's just reminding that and speaking in the clip to George Bailey about why his existence and his efforts matter to patients in absolute numeric terms, as well as the qualitative stuff that really matters. In the video, Dr. Bailey is approaching burnout and he actually says he wishes he'd never become a GP. Is that how bad you think things are for many GPs? I think that's what burnout feels like. It's that sense of frustration, of tension, of knowing that it could be done better. All of those feelings where we become depersonalized to that idea of the individual in front of us. And it's where you need that guardian angel stepping in, just tap you on the shoulder and say, actually, each consultation is an opportunity to turn this round and to make a difference to that individual. And then we do that thousands of times a year to sort of change populations and communities. Tell us about the production of the video and what that was actually like, because there's some really interesting things. I mean, one is, I don't know how much time it must take to put something like that together, but it must have taken a lot of your time. And then on top of that, you did get together quite an ensemble cast to actually mm -hmm. star on the video. There's two elements of it. First of all, knowing the people who are in the clip, they knew what I could produce, having worked with them before on different things. 
a few years ago, I rewrote Kipling's If poem that was all about general practice again. And Nikki Kanani and Helen Stokes Lampard were both delivering lines within that. But the idea of that particular clip was just to talk about the kind of trials and tribulations from general practice, the things that we enjoy, the things that we get frustrated with and want to change, but highlight the diversity within the profession, the many different voices from different areas of the country. By country, I mean four nations. And that was quite a fun project to sort of get everybody reading little bits of lines as we went through it. So people knew and had confidence in what I could do from a production value uh, aspect. And then it was a case of, okay, now I need to get the drawings done and to illustrate the storyboard that we were producing. So one of the first images I drew, it's the one of George approaching burnout, where it's got that subtracting background and his wide-eyed, visceral sort of desperation in his expression. But drawing that as a concept to say, this is the moment that he wishes he'd never been a GP and showing that kind of nightmare marish visualization of what burnout feels like in terms of the images how does that process work I've got to figure out because obviously It's a Wonderful Life is a normal movie length production and I don't think people would have the patience to sit through that in terms of what we're after here. So it's condensed down into the nine minutes and you've got to work out what are the key points that I need to illustrate in terms of introducing the character, how you can introduce him and Mary and their idealism. That's quite an early image. The discussion between the Almighty and the Guardian Angels, I think that's quite a sort of an iconic image that people associate with It's a Wonderful Life. And then the antagonists, you know, the opportunity to show George as the idealist, the person that sticks up for continuity of care and quality general practice against the archetypal villain of Potter, who is trying to change the town and change what's going on and motivated by profit. So it's getting those images. So for a lot of the references, it's sort of using those key scenes that you can see in It's a Wonderful Life, where you can see Bailey and Potter talking across a table with that metaphorical barrier between them and then start to introduce the elements. So obviously one of the scenes shows George Bailey FaceTiming with his sons and clearly that's not in the 1940s (laughs) original. So it's all introducing those elements and then you can bring in the guardian angel who of course is male in It's a Wonderful Life, but I really wanted Helen, her recognisable, voice and I think her diction is incredible the way she reads the script she really brings it to life so I was really pleased when she did say yes but in terms of sounding the mouse it was probably a year in advance of actually making it to say look this is what I'm planning and it's just sitting down and getting the time to do it did Nikki Kanani take much persuading to star as the almighty I think it got her in the feels in terms of when I mentioned it to her she just went oh yes Because I think she recognised, you know, it's how we can do something innovative to bring out this evidence on the effectiveness so that we can speak to the individual. This is speaking to somebody who's struggling or somebody who needs to know that what they're doing has intrinsic value. You said you started talking about the idea a year ago. I mean, how much of your time has it taken to pull this together? The idea in terms of formulating it and saying, how could I tell the story of continuity of care? What's a really important story that gets people sort of feeling good? And so It's a Wonderful Life came up in that thinking. But actually, when I sat down to actually get it started, I think I started towards the end of May and it was done by the second week of June. So once I actually get down and start doing something, it motivates itself in terms of when you get stuck into something creative, it actually gives itself its own fuel. So it didn't seem like a lot of work once I got stuck into it. So all the drawings were done over about a week to 10 days. And then it was a case of when you're creating a video, you have to match the visuals to the audio. You use the audio as the basis, trying to get everybody's audio submission sorted so that I could place it into the timeline and then time the drawings and the images and the animations to what I was hearing. Well, it's a fantastic end result. And I think it does start to find a way of expressing some of the things that I think are really difficult about general practice. We had David Haslam on the podcast recently. He's got this great book called Side Effects. And he was talking about general practice and the challenges general practice has. He was talking about this issue of a lot of the work that general practice does just isn't sexy enough to garner any attention Mm. because it's not rescuing people in the way that some other emergency care is and other services are. And so it becomes difficult, not only for the public, I think, to totally sort of grasp the value that general practice brings, but also maybe GPs themselves. Is that what you were trying to be able to find a way of encapsulating with this? Yeah, I mean, I remember David talking about it and it made me smile listening to the podcast because he was quoting the same references that are in GP's A Wonderful Life. 
in terms of, he quotes Sandvik and the reductions in hospital admissions out of hours, attendance and deaths, because you can sort of remember that. And even Jeremy Hunt's got that one when he was talking about it on the select committee to say, right, if you increase the continuity over a 15 year period compared to one year with a registered GP, that was the Norwegian data, then you result in 30 percent reduction in out of hours attendances, 28 percent reduction in admissions, 25 percent reduction in deaths. These are the key statistics that are found to say, look, if you can invest in that continuity and reach that point, and as I say, from my own personal perspective, I'm now in my 16th year at my practice. So I love that data to say, well, this is what I've spent my career doing up until this point. So it was lovely when he was doing it and talking about it. And I think it came up in Martin Marshall's conference speech that focused on continuity. A lot of it was hitting those same references that are in GP's A Wonderful Life. But in terms of David Haslam's comments of sexing up general practice, I think that's where you can look at it and say, well, what does that look like if you are reducing hospital deaths, if you're reducing admissions and out of hours attendance, what does that look like in a town? Growing up in the 80s, key sort of times element of it was back to the future. And for people remembering being erased from existence, you know, that family shot of, oh my goodness, Marty McFly's family are disappearing. Well, I just thought I'll put that in, in terms of showing a town scene where you can literally show the proportion of people that are the same as what the statistics are telling us on continuity of care. You start erasing them from existence. It's a nice sort of nod in the clip in that one of the scenes of the families that you can see where they're being erased is actually my own family. And in April of this year, we lost my mother-in-law. So as part of that, as working through the grief, that old phrase, art is pain, one of the images is of her disappearing. And one of the things when my son's watching the clip back, he just says, can we fast forward to the bit where Nana comes back? So it was a nice sort of little extra poignant moment, little Easter egg in the clip there. But in terms of just highlighting the differences that this makes with continuity of care, are the families and the emotions and the avoidable elements. You know, you're not seeing it in a headline. David was talking about it. Even the person that didn't have the heart attack doesn't realize that they didn't have it because of the preventative medicine. But that's the difference general practice is making in terms of when you see these differences in mortality ratios, it's not accident, it's not chance, it's statistically significant. And so so it's just generating that in terms of if you can see the lives that are affected within the clip, you know, you can use that trope from Back to the Future to show the elements of families disappearing. But more importantly, when you reach redemption to bring those people back, you know, that's the idea. That's the hope that is there that you can start to see the difference that general practice makes. How do you think about the future of continuity of care in, in general practice? Do you think we can maintain it going forward? Well, it requires that will, the political will to, to realise the impact that it has. If people want the votes because of evidence of effectiveness, then it's got to be in political policy to say, right, we need to have those minimum staffing levels and an action plan for areas that are understaffed to say, right, this is where we're going to put our investment and time to ensure that continuity is achieved. I'd love it to appear on our screens and surgeries just to say, OK, your current level of continuity is using a usual provider of care index or whatever other measure of continuity to say seven of your last 10 consultations have been with the same GP. You can identify those patients that benefit from continuity. Not every patient needs continuity. Of course, you know, there are some transactions where it's just, I need to see the doctor and this is what's going on. But for a lot of the times, people can sort of say, okay, if it's a joint problem, if it's an infection, you don't need continuity at that moment. So there's a certain subset of patients that won't be relying on continuity. But ultimately, continuity always finds its way in there. If you're getting a certain number of infections, you need the continuity to identify that. Or if you can just realize, hang on, this set of infections might be the sign of an underlying malignancy. It needs the continuity to identify and see the patterns to work out that that could be a possibility to make a referral at the earliest point that achieves a difference in outcomes in terms of mortality. So continuity raises itself at multiple opportunities through a career. But ultimately, when you're seeing patients and you've seen the list in front of you and you know half to three quarters of them because you know exactly where you've been, you've been to their homes, you've seen them multiple times over multiple episodes, that shortens a lot of your consultations. It's more efficient for practitioners and patients rate it higher as well. 
So I think we need to establish a routine measure within general practice with the technology that we have just to say, okay, this is a long-term condition patient. How often are we achieving that continuity with the same practitioner or a team that is identifiably their particular team? Because you can achieve continuity within practice teams if you don't have that same individual doctor at every consultation. I mean, there was hope, wasn't there, in that Health and Social Care Select Committee report that you mentioned that Jeremy Hunt chaired before he went on to be treasurer that yeah. did quite a bit in its recommendations about measuring continuity of care and reporting on continuity of care. I and mean, obviously, we wait on the government's response to that. It's nice that we have sort of somebody who gets general practice at this moment in time. It's been a very strange experience seeing how Jeremy Hunt was perceived as health secretary <laughs> all of a sudden now when he was on that health select committee just to sort of say, OK, he's getting the Sandvik data now. If somebody is able to sort of influence and he's become one of our people that espouses the virtues of general practice. So now he's in a position where he's got the purse strings as chancellor. That's then saying, you know, are we still going to get that ethos, that understanding of general practice filtering down to our latest Secretary of State for Health. What did you think about the recommendations in the well, the stock take review that recommended almost like splitting out urgent care and general practice and continuity of care? It's a way of trying to recognise that dichotomy of how do you achieve what patients need in terms of access, that's one element of a healthcare system, but also providing the quality David Haslam was talking about in terms of affordability, quality and access, that you can only have two of the three. And it's how you achieve that. You know, it's very easy to just offer, as he said, these one minute appointments, but nobody's going to get quality out of that. It's all about how do you achieve that level of access that's required. And I'd say most of general practice is involved in continuity in terms of long term conditions and the stuff that makes a difference to the data that makes a difference to votes is knowing that you're going to get quality. It would be very easy easy to provide a bad service that has full access that you can just see everybody with very short time slots and it's just a, a conveyor belt but I don't think that's what patients want and I know it's not what professionals want. Well I hope people do watch the video people haven't seen it yet where can they find it Jamie? Well, at the moment, obviously, the college has it on its YouTube channel, but it's still unlisted. So it went out in an email to members, so everybody will have it. And it's in the read more section. It's in the and finally bit of Claire Gerrard's email that came out. I'm hoping that it will be publicly listed. But in the meantime, it's available through Twitter. So I've broken it down into four segments on Twitter. The full nine minute clip is at the end of that thread. So I'm at Artful Doctor on Twitter and it's in my pinned tweet. Or if you want to see the full nine minutes through the college website, then you can access it through the link that's at the end of that thread. We'll link up the link to the YouTube channel in the show notes. So if you haven't seen it, just go to the show notes, click on the link and you'll be able to access the video there. And what's next for you? This doesn't sound like it's your first project, so I suspect it won't be your last. Any thoughts about what you're going to do next? Well, that's the beauty. I mean, this is the only project that I've thought about significantly in advance before actually putting it into production. And when it eventually sort of came to, I think it's totaling it up using Procreate with all the different layers of the images. I think it's about 20 images and it's about 133 hours of work that went into it. Now, a lot of my projects are designed to have something that is short and snappy and three minutes and these kind of things. So this is technically long at nine minutes. But the idea is looking through it and sort of saying, well, what are the things that can get people feeling good about general practice? Because that's the most important thing to say that you can walk in with your shoulders back, with your head upright and saying, I'm making a great difference today. I think that's a really important thing. And I think I need that too. You know, it's part of creativity. It's one of the things that I've had in my appraisals that creativity is an antidote to burnout. So by creating things, you know, the very first thing I did for the college was called the National Health which is still on the college's YouTube account. But it was a competition to inspire the next generation back in 2015. It's saying, can you say something positive? You know, it's all to do with this atmosphere of sort of people being negative about general practice. Does it sound familiar? You know, it's one of these things that was there in 2015. And so they said you could write a poem, draw something or draw a picture or an image. And I didn't see the word or. So I wrote the poem and drew the picture and did the whole image. And it was all to do with the great things about general practice. And so that then became my introduction to the social media world that people said, are you on Twitter? And I was like, no, I've got an impulse control problem. I probably shouldn't be on Twitter. And, uh, and they said, oh, because you're trending. I said, is that good? 
it was an unadulterated positivity just to say, okay, there's enough negatives out there, but what about the positives? What are the things that we can hold on to that make us feel that what we do is worthwhile? And then from there, you can do collaborations with other GPs up and down the country and GP Kipling. We did a musical version when we weren't allowed to mix. That one was rewriting Billy Joel's Start the Fire. We didn't start the fire, but it's all to do with the legacy of general practice and the difference it makes from the inception of the NHS right through to the pandemic and beyond. But that was a nice opportunity to have a little sing with my brother, who's an incredibly talented musician and annoyingly can sing and play every instrument. So that was an opportunity for us to record the tracks and then build in the images of the lyrics and, and the wording. So that was another sort of project. So quite often they just arise out of a moment of need, whether that's a moment of personal adversity, grief or sort of struggles from a work perspective. Finding that creativity that just is a, an emotional outlet, I suppose, just to either express the hope and pride for better days ahead, as it is in GP's A Wonderful Life, or to sort of, you know, get things off your chest and sort of say, well, actually, I need to link and connect with people who share these ideals that general practice is a wonderful career and it's a wonderful job again i would recommend people do watch the video because i think it is something that is very much worth watching and i think as well you know jamie general practice is in need nationally of more support with its overall national communication so everything that you do i think is really highly valued so thanks so much for doing it and thanks for taking the time out to talk to me today I really appreciate it, Ben. It's been an absolute pleasure. As you can tell, I could talk for England on this because it's such an important message to get out there that patients and professionals, we've got the frustration because we know what a glorious experience it is when you connect with a doctor that knows you, that identifies with you, that has that tangible memories and is able to use their clinical expertise to make that difference to patients and communities. It does matter to patients. It matters to professionals. And it's a brilliant message to get out there. Help Dr. Bailey. He's a good guy. Please help my daddy. Please help my George. Looks like we'll have we'll to, have send, to someone. send someone. Lots, Lots of people, people asking over, over a GP. GP. George Bailey? Bailey? You're right. We'll have to send somebody immediately. Looks like it's that Clara's turn. She hasn't, she hasn't got, got her, her wings her yet, has she? Has she? Take, Take a good, a good look, look at Dr. Dr. Bailey. Bailey. He's a he's doctor, a doctor married, married to Mary, Mary with three, three children, children, but he's but losing he's faith in what matters, matters in, his in his fitness to practice, to practice and make a difference. I want to do something big, something important. Most of my friends have got out. George, George gave, gave up and moved, up moved to, to Europe to help, to help out here at Bailey, at Bailey Brothers after, after his father, his father died. died. Mr. Potter, Mr. Potter is trying to buy out the practice and run it for their shareholders, a surgery run for their profit. You're talking about the things you can't get your fingers on compassion, continuity, giving people dignity and care. This town needs this institution, if only so they don't have to go crawling to Potter. Sentimental hogwash. So George, so George took, took over, over at Bailey, Bailey Brothers, Brothers and became, became a, GP, a GP, staying for 15, 15 years, years, caring, caring for patients and building relationships, relationships over time, becoming, becoming an essential, essential part of the community of with his with work, work family. family. You're an ambitious young man. You're George Bailey. Intelligent, smart, hates his job, hates the Bailey brothers almost as much as I do, has to sit by and watch his friends go places while he's trapped, frittering his life away, playing nursemaid to his community. What's your point, Mr. Potter? The point is, I want to hire you, to manage my affairs, run my properties, living in the nicest house in town, buying your wife a lot of fine clothes, couple of business trips a year. Your ship has come in, provided you have enough brains to climb aboard. You sit around here and you spin your little webs, thinking the world revolves around you and your money, but it doesn't. The answer's no. Potter's, Potter's words, words echoed, echoed round George's, round George's mind, mind, trying, trying to, find to find the deep the meaning in his, in life, his life, his purpose. His purpose. You've, probably You've probably already guessed, guessed that George that Bailey, Bailey doesn't, doesn't leave Bailey Brothers. Brothers. He, raised he raised his family, his family as, they as they arrived, arrived making, making their, house their house into a home, into a home night, night after night, night coming, coming back, back late from the surgery. Well, it's another red letter day for the Baileys. Daddy, have you seen the brand's new car next door? You should see it, it's really cool. What's the matter with our car? Isn't it good enough for you? <sighs> yes, Daddy. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse you for what? But I burped. Susie's bike's broken, Daddy. What's wrong with it now? You've got to fix it. The pedals need fixing. Susie's pedals? Seriously? Everything's broken. I've had it. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm sorry, Mary. 
kids, I'm sorry. I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can help me, show me the way. I wish I'd never become a GP. Dr. Bailey, can you help? I need help and I don't know what else to do. How have you fallen this far? I didn't fall in. I jumped in. To save you. I knew if I was struggling, you'd save me and you did. I'm the answer to your prayer. I know all about you. I've watched you grow up from a young doctor. What well, are you, a mind reader or something? Well, who are you? I'm your guardian angel. Here for you to help. What's that modern phrase? A peer mentor? I'm worth more as any other kind of doctor than just a GP. <sighs> I'm not going to get my wings with that attitude. You just don't know all the things that you've done. If it hadn't been for you... If it hadn't been for me being a GP, everyone would have been a lot better off. My wife, my kids, my patients. Go off and mentor somebody else. This isn't going to be easy. I wish I'd never been a GP. Okay. You've got your wish. You've never been a GP. What's going on around here? Why am I seeing all these strange things? You've been given a great gift, a chance for you to see what GP life is like without you and those like you. Strange, isn't it? Each GP life touches so many other lives when they're not around. It leaves an awful hole, doesn't it? You see, George, you've really had a wonderful career. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to wish it all away? This is all some kind of trick. I can get out of this, just you see. OK, you need convincing then. Here's the impact you make in just two years of continuity. By being there through those two years, you've reduced the chance of visiting an outpatient department by nearly 20%. The chance of a hospital admission reduced by nearly 25%. That's a lot of healthcare costs if you'd not been there. But let's not stop there. You've always prided yourself on making sure the team sees patients with the same problem, more than seven out of 10 consultations. Had you let things drift? With lower continuity and patients or different professionals, such that say it was only four out of 10 consultations, there wouldn't have been that 12.5% reduction in hospital admissions. Well, I did always think it was the right thing. Plus, it made me feel better knowing the story without having to go over it again and again. And so you should. And these aren't just one-off examples. 18 out of 22 high-quality studies show reductions in deaths relating to that continuity that you provide. That's been reproduced in nine countries, across three continents. The effect size is small, but it's in the same range as treatment effects. If it were a drug, you'd prescribe it. Well, I suppose when you put it that way. Now, all that's about healthcare costs and the cost of admissions and so on. But think about you wishing you'd never been a GP. You'd have been a different kind of doctor, and I'm sure you'd be doing just fine. But look at this town without you. In just four years, if you had your wish, along with a 1% increase in hospital doctors, you'd have had 186 fewer hospital deaths, which is great. But in four years, if there'd been 1% more GPs, there'd be 575 fewer hospital deaths, which of course would have been wonderful. You've been a GP nearly four times that, so that's a difference of more than 1,500 patients that are not here had you not been here and that the 1% like you never became a GP. And this is the town without them? All those changes, those families and communities. That's why there's no Michael, no Margaret, no Enid. I'm afraid so, George. You didn't exist as their GP and the many more that are no longer here. Your continuity of care matters. There's clear proof that beyond that first year of GP continuity, the reductions keep falling the longer the continuity. Why, after your 15 years here, you've reduced out-of-hours attendance by 30%, hospital admissions by 28%, and most obviously deaths are reduced by 25% after that amount of continuity of care. But that's huge. Of course it's huge. It's what great quality general practice can achieve if it's funded and resourced with the rewards enough to ensure that continuity. Just because we didn't notice it happening doesn't mean it wasn't true. 
And all that is without taking into account those moments and connections that save quality in people's lives, as well as quantity. Earning the right for those patients to call you my doctor. My doctor? Clara, help me, Clara, get me back. I want to be a GP again. <laughs> oh, feels like Christmas. Hello, Bedford Falls. My wife, my children, my practice. George, it's a miracle. I've never seen anything like it. Look at these thank you cards, these letters of kindness from patients and families. This colleague feedback, it's amazing. No GP is a failure who has friends, colleagues in the college. Thanks for the wings, Clara.